We are so happy to welcome and be in the presence of Father William Hart McNichols, a world-renowned iconographer who also served as an AIDS hospice minister in New York City. He now assists with sacramental ministry in New Mexico. Bill will reflect on his relationship with Dan and Phil Berrigan, on his images of them and other holy men and women. This evening is hosted by the Daniel Berrigan Collective, which was founded to promote the person, thought, and legacy and activism of Daniel Berrigan, using a variety of media, including writing, art, music, poetry, celebration, and social media. The collective comes out of the tradition promoted by Berrigan, in which contemplation, reflection, and study flow into and from community, activism, and resistance. We aim to provide a space for dialogue between the writings of Daniel Berrigan and contemporary communities of resistance that share his concerns and expand them, centering on the experiences and concerns of women, folks of color, younger people, LGBTQ plus people, immigrants, the incarcerated, and those who have difficulty finding a voice in academic, religious, and social institutions. Our next <clears throat> webinar event is coming up this Thursday, and it's a celebration of the 100th birthday of Phil Berrigan. And that will take place on Thursday, October 5th at seven. Uh, please join us and please check out the Dan Berrigan Collective website for past webinars, our journal, monthly reflections. It's pretty awesome. So hope to see you also on Thursday to celebrate the life and work of Phil Berrigan. So again, just reminding everyone uh, if they could be on mute, I see Carolyn's iPad might need to be on mute. And uh, particularly because I would love for us to just settle into that experience of, of deep silence, ground ourselves, So again, uh, Daniel Francis, if you could be on mute. So in that silence, I would like for us to listen to the words of Daniel Berrigan. And this uh, is a few passages uh, that comes from his book, Sorrow Built a Bridge, Friendship and AIDS. We are being instructed <clears throat> in a thousand foul ways how to make it, at whose expense is of little matter, nor the cost paid, those who pay being other than ourselves the place of payment invariably elsewhere. Still the cost is never canceled. Those who pay lurk like uneasy ghost in the shadows cast by the great orb of Gog in New Orleans. They pay and pay, the homeless in our streets, the peasants of Nicaragua. I want to learn and I don't want to learn the opposite, how to lose as others are losing well and nobly. May one thus unlearn gradually the lessons of the culture, lessons which all said come down to a simple calculus, how to win and the devil take the hindmost. Every Titanic sinks there was, they boasted, only one, and it refused to coexist with the seas to reverence the might of another far greater power. It must win, therefore it lost. Do
Do we, like ships too proud, too weighty, sail off and simply go under? A sign that creation cannot bear the weight, the pride. If it were all, what interest would attach to death, or indeed to life itself? The great spirits of our species are a vindication, a something more. They are worth watching. They bring drama and a great cry to the inevitable, thereby transforming it to vocation, choice, celebration. Amen. Amen. And now, the moment we've been waiting for, take it away, Bill. Hi. Hello. Um, yeah, that was beautiful. It really brought me back, you know, to uh, the 1980s. And um, I wanted to, I kind of wanted to start off with the concept of voice. And each of these, each of these people has a voice. And it was wonderful that you read Dan's voice. Um, just, just to say something, um, I have a friend named Sandy Gold, and she was uh, diagnosed with a deadly brain tumor. And she's written about it in a book that comes out in uh, December called I Choose Love. And um, reading her book, I was aware of her voice and how powerful. And yet, you know, she uses humor. And um, I'll say that encountering Dan's voice was a major, encountering before Dan, Jim Douglas' voice was a major change in my entire life. When I read Jim Douglas' The Nonviolent Cross, I was 20. And um, I remember reading it out in the country, um, where the Jesuits would go during the summer, and there'd be bunk beds. And I was alone in the room with like 10 bunk beds. And I was just looking out the window and reading his book and thinking, oh my God, somebody's making sense of what I felt all my life. And it was that book, The Nonviolent Cross, that really, uh, in some ways led me to Dan, although our novice master used to mimeograph articles of Dan, and this would have been 1968, and give us those uh, to read, and he really admired him. You can go so far. Where is that Cuba to go is a great place to get pastries, but... Hello? Am I still... You're fine. Yes, we can okay. hear you. Yes, yes. Okay. <clears throat> I heard a commercial or something in the middle. <laughs> I don't know what it was. I um, muted that person, yes. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, yeah, I think I've been, you know, sitting on this all week like an egg, you know, trying to figure out. Um, but, but really, what happened is that... Um, I read um, No Bars to Manhood and a lot of Dan's early poetry. And I was aware that I was reading a voice that uh, was absolutely unique. And aware that that, that voice, because he's, he has, you know, such a poetic voice, but also such a poetic vocabulary and choice of words. Um, his painting palette is just huge. He has so many colors he can use, you know? And I remember when I was reading, um, when I was doing this icon and I was reading that full quote, he talks about Holy Prophet Simeon, you know, Simeon and Anna uh, waiting at the presentation. And he said, Simeon grew vatic. <laughs> and I had to look up what is Vatic, you know, and it's like taken away uh, in a prophetic voice. And um, I really think that that's a way to describe Dan. Um, and when you read him, when I read him for the first times, I was just uh, stunned. I felt like I was reading Isaiah or Jeremiah 
or one of the prophets. And at that time, 1968, 69, 70, 71, you know, there was a lot of people writing and there was a lot of people talking about about the war, about um, poverty, about racism, about uh, women's rights. But Dan had this voice that for me was very gripping and I never, I never tried to meet him because when I read him, uh, I felt, you know, I thought, oh my gosh, he would never like me or accept me, you know, so I'm, I'm not going to even try to meet him. <clears throat> so when I moved to New York in 1980 to go to Pratt Institute for Art, um, in 82, 82, 83, AIDS broke out fully. And um, at that time, I was asked to do the first mass for people with AIDS. And uh, when I was asked, I knew this is not just a mass. You know, this is opening a door to another vocation and another life completely. And I'd kind of been praying for that because I was finishing my art degree. I, I had uh, at Pratt, we had to do an exhibit to graduate. My exhibit was paintings of Prospect Park. So um, I was <clears throat> at the same time, uh, by the way, it's very dry in New Mexico, so I'm going to have to be drinking water. But <clears throat> at the same time, I began working after the mass. People said, will you visit my brother? Will you visit my lover? Will you visit my cousin? So <clears throat> I was all over the city visiting people. And, um, <clears throat> excuse me. So <clears throat> one time um, I was taking the uptown one train at uh, 72nd Street. And the doors opened and there was Dan sitting on the other side. And I I walked in and I thought, oh, my God, you know, I had ex expected him to be a lot shorter. And he really wasn't. He was about 5'11". Five, five but he was sitting down and I was, you know, swaying on the on the top bar or holding on to the pole. And I finally introduced myself. And in typical Dan, he began asking questions like, well, what do you do, you know? And I said, well, I'm a hospice chaplain. And he goes, oh, are you a little brother of Jesus? And I said, no. And he said, well, are you in any order? And I said, yes. <laughs> and he said, which one? I went, the Jesuits? And he goes, oh, no, <laughs> no, you, <laughs> you can't be. I said, yes, and he goes, okay, why haven't you gotten a hold of me so far? Um, and I said, well, to be honest, I was scared of you. So he said, well, we'll go out on a picnic. And then later on, he called me and we took the Staten Island Ferry over to Staten Island and, and had a picnic. And I kind of um, told him, you know, why I had been fearful to meet him because I said, and actually this kind of turned out to be true, you know, um, Prophets have a blowtorch mouth. And when they aim that blowtorch on Washington, D.C., or on a war, or on um, any kind of system of injustice, it's perfect. But when they aim it on you, one person, it can incinerate you, you know? And... Uh, there were several times I got that blowtorch, <laughs> not from Phil, but from Dan. <clears throat> but I always recovered because uh, we had this friendship. And I knew, you know, I would get a note later, um, you know, can we go to lunch or can we talk? And then he'd basically say, I'm sorry. So, so it was uh, that time. And he said, what are you doing? And I, I you know, I told him that I was doing that. Um, I was working with at St. Vincent's Hospital. He said, I want to do that. And he, of course, had already been working with the dying at St. Rose's. And he wrote that book, uh, 
we we live before we die i think is the title of it and he had written that book so he was already familiar with hospice work but it was a whole new thing for him to be with primarily gay men and uh he was absolutely i remember he was absolutely delighted because they didn't hold back anything they would tell him everything and I don't think he had ever been treated uh, so nicely on that kind of a level where they didn't care who he was, what he had done. <clears throat> they knew he was some kind of a priest and a lot of them did know his reputation, but they were at the point when you're, when you're dying, you get to a point where they're saying everything and they weren't afraid to, uh, to say anything to Dan and he he really loved that loved meeting you know all different kinds of people and at that time from 1983 to 1990 um one one day I would be in some palace on Park Avenue you know and the next day I'd be up in the Bronx and um I remember talking to someone and cockroaches were coming out of the ceiling and landing on me and i'd be brushing them away you know and this guy was so poor he had um he had a dog but all the papers were on the floor and he couldn't pick them up so you know i helped him pick up the papers and stuff and then we also had this team which had social workers you know so i i wasn't alone in that work and he wasn't alone in the work and sometimes we would do a funeral for somebody together if we both knew them. And uh, so I think uh, back to his voice, if you open up any one of his books, it's still there. It's still relevant. It's still so powerful. And so when, um, when he died, uh, April 30th, 2016, I, of course, I wanted to do his icon, and I think it was the first, first icon I did of somebody that I knew. And I thought, how am I going to picture him? You know, so I had a photograph of Frida holding her son Seamus and giving him to Dan, you know, like in the, in the presentation uh, in the temple. And uh, Dan is, is grabbing him, you know, by the back of his neck and, and bringing him forward. And Frida actually had her arm on the back of, of the baby. But with, <laughs> without Frida's arm, it looks like, you know, Dan's, Dan's grasp of him looks funny. And I did not realize that until I finished the icon. But anyway, I made Seamus into the Christ child. And um, I gave Dan the prophet's flame above his head. And then I quoted that thing about, you know, sorry for burning papers instead of children. That, that one of the most powerful things he ever said, one of the most searingly powerful, um, gives you goosebumps, you know. It's, it's semi-caustic. Uh, it's just aimed right at the right spot. And that blowtorch is just perfect. It just hits the exact spot. Yeah, sorry about burning paper instead of children, but we can't live with the thought of the land of the burning children. And that is probably one of the most powerful things he ever, he ever wrote that when you read it, it's still relevant today. You know, no matter when you think of I'm wearing this Ukraine T-shirt and I'm like ever like all of you, I'm uh, I'm in continual grief about what's going on. You know, their entire culture is being destroyed. Uh, the people uh, kidnapped the whole thing. So um, I think I'll stop there unless you have any questions about uh, Dan.
Hello? <laughs> yeah. So it's more of a oh. comment, Bill, but um, just okay. thank you for that sharing. It, it, it's just, um, you feel like everything is collapsing these days, Ukraine and so much else. Um, yeah. And the sharing of these stories, the humanity of the stories is really a bomb to the soul. And I'm, I'm so grateful for the sharing. Um, so thank you, thank you. We also will have time for questions at the end of the presentation, so. Okay. Well, you know, at, I, I have to say, at that time between 83 and 90, I felt exactly like I do now. It seemed like the whole world was dying because I was in Manhattan and um, there were so many people. You know, when I first went into the hospice, I was seeing partly older people with cancer and partly gay people dying of, of AIDS. And uh, by, by about six months, it was filling with young men. And then by a year, it went from like 100 to 500 to 1,000 to 4,000 to, I mean, not in that one hospital, but in the city. So at that same time, there was a homeless crisis and people were sleeping on top of the subway grills, you know, to, and um, <clears throat> I would be walking around people to get to the hospital. So it felt like, it just felt like um, some kind of uh, a dark world, you know? And yet, um, because at the same time I was illustrating children's books, I have that joy of just working on these children's books, you know? And um, I think also the fact that I was age 33 to 40 helped a lot. You know, I had, I at that age you have hope, I think, at least I did. Um, you have hope against hope, you know? But also what, what was wonderful for me was the intimacy with, with the people. There was nothing in the way, you know, they were dying. And um, while they were able to, we'd go to lunch or we'd go to a movie. And then the next day they'd be in the hospital and the next day they'd be gone. So getting to know people and getting to really hear their, their whole life story, if they had time to tell me, was profoundly moving for me and um, really was in the deepest sense meaningful. Philip. So if we wanted to move uh, to Phil. Okay. Yes, uh, well, you know, through Dan, I met his whole family. I mean, they would they would come to the Jesuit community. Um, and I remember um, when Liz came, I was, we were, I, it was like one of those things where we were instantly friends. We instantly recognized each other because Liz is an artist and uh, taught art history, you know? So she knows a lot about art, but also she has an artistic personality that does not usually come out to most people. So we loved each other immediately. And um, then uh, we would go, Dan and Bob Keck and some people, uh, other, other Jesuits and other people would go to Jonah House and I remember the first time I got there and, and got to meet Phil because, of course, um, growing up with reading everything, literally, that Dan ever wrote, and then reading Phil's The Lamb's War and reading different things that he and that book that he and Liz put together, um, I was aware, again, Liz and Phil had different voices than Dan. And meeting Phil... Um, he was in every way a towering person. Um, I just, I, it's, it's difficult to describe because he carried, for me, he carried enormous dignity. And um, he and I 
really got along. I remember somebody saying, you know, Phil hardly likes anybody and he likes you. <laughs> and I laughed so hard and I said, that's because he doesn't know me yet, you know. But um, I really, I, you know, I could see Phil. Well, tomorrow is the Feast of St. Francis. And I'll just say this. St. Francis is the only fundamentalist that ever lived, you know, true fundamentalist. Um, everybody else has something that they say we don't really need to do, you know, but Francis was almost like uh, a mime, you know, copying everything Jesus did, including name his, naming his orders, the least little brothers, or the friar, uh, frati minori in Italian. So Phil it had a fundamentalist streak about um, Christian nonviolence. He had a, an unwavering part of him that was equally as blowtorchy, you know, as Dan was. And he could see things in a way, he could see through what was happening. And I have this card that I made with, I wrote on the back of it, uh, this time for prayer that he did along uh, a little bit before he died. And it's just full of these, um, it begins with, um, the following occur to me as worthwhile subjects of prayer, that we disarm, disarm our hearts and our society, that the Holy Spirit subvert, stalemate, and expose preparation for the invasion of Iraq, that God intervene in the ecological crisis as Lord of creation because we refuse to change our abuse of the earth. So it's, you know, bang, 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 one after another thing. And when I was with he and Liz, um, they had a, a picture book uh, of the entire, um, with the whole Oppenheimer thing out now, the movie out, everybody knows what I'm talking about, but it was an actual picture book of the effects of dropping the bomb on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And I asked him if I could take it home because I envisioned a picture of uh, Mary. And, you know, that's, I'd have to go into that whole thing, so I won't. But I, I wanted to use, put Mary in front of the atomic bomb as if she was stopping it. And then when Phil died, um, and I went to his, you know, I went there while he was dying. Um, he died uh, December 6, um, 2002. And I was there with, with a lot of people and, and they were all busy. Jerry was busy making his coffin. And they gave me the lid of the coffin and I, I painted it. And I remember I painted 21 roses for a 21 rose salute. And then I painted a Celtic cross in the middle with his name on it. And so I was deeply um, engrossed in that. And while he was dying, um, Amy Goodman came with Dennis. Different people came to pay him homage, you know. And I was, I would kind of see these people, but then I'd go back to, to work and... Um, when he died, I, I got to do the burial. Um, and I remember it being in December, you know, it was very cold and we went outside. And I remember Jim Reale and a bunch of the, the men and women were holding torches. So I always say it was kind of like the burial of King Arthur, you know, out in the night holding torches and, um, so when I came home, I wanted to do his icon and I, I decided I'm going to place him right in front, blocking that nuclear bomb, blocking it with his presence and with his vocation and putting um, the Bible in his hands. And uh, he's looking directly at you. And the words say this, I mean, the Greek letters are not usual usually you say holy philip or for a woman you say you know holy hildegard or holy 
whatever. And it's, for a woman, it's hagia, and for a man, it's oagios. So um, for other saints, you put oagios, you know, um, Albert the Great or whatever. But for Philip and Dan, I put holy prophet, Philip, holy prophet, Daniel. So that was just my experience of um, just having, just having been at his funeral, which John Deere did the funeral, and um, having been with all those people walking through the streets, and um, then coming home and and really settling down and trying to envision him. Yeah, I, I, I have to say, you know, it, it's funny when, when he would decide to do something, he would just do it. Like I went there and um, at that time, um, we were all smoking, well, the three of us were all smoking. And I remember, uh, you know, Liz and I would go out and have a smoking break outside. And then Phil decided that they were going to give it up for a month. And that was it. They just stopped and and gave it up. And I was, I was just shocked at the uh, discipline that he had, you know, inside him. So um, that's just one little example. But also a deep tenderness, especially a incredible love for his his children. And they both did. They both had. Or Liz is still with us, but. They both have an uh, incredible love, and their children are all growing up and doing the same wonderful things, you know? Thank you. Bill, would you like to move to the next icon? Sure. Ooh. Boy. It's hard. <sighs> wow. Okay. <clears throat> um, yeah, this is what Diana does to me, you know, I, okay, Robert Ellsberg, you know, published um, her, her book about being kidnapped in uh, 19, I think it was, oh, I think it was All Souls Day, actually, uh, November 2nd, 1989, and, um, <clears throat> He sent it to me. It was the hardback and uh, or hardcover, and I I decided to read it one night. And I sat up and I was reading it, and I got a phone call from my theologian friend John Dadowski, and I picked up the phone, and he knew right away. He said, "What is wrong with you? You know what is going on?" And I said, "I'm reading this book," and I just he said, "You have to put that book down. You're really." You're going too far over, you know, to the other side. And I knew I was. I mean, I knew that I had never read an account of a martyrdom by a person who lived through the martyrdom. And that's what I felt like I was reading. Um, the other thing about the book was that that was so horrifying to me was it was obvious that she was uneducated um, or inexperienced about sex in, in a very innocent way, almost like a child, you know, almost like somebody. And so when she was writing about what they did to her, it would take you a few minutes to say, what, what is she talking about? You know, it's like a little, like a little girl would say, um, you know, he stuck that funny thing in my whatever, you know, and you'd go, what funny thing? And then you'd realize, oh, my God, you know, 
And that's how it was reading Diana. She, there were things that, that they did to her, which um, were so, so horrible and, you know, just, just awful. And so reading it, I was aware, juxtaposing her innocence, her, and her, she was very lovely, very, um, the picture on the front of the book, um, she's looking at you and she's, she's just very naturally beautiful. But if you look into her eyes, there's just this complete terror, you know, and um, again, juxtaposing this innocent, beautiful young woman with these eyes that have seen things that hopefully none of us will ever see. So I'm reading it and reading all the things that they did to her and then made her do. And then she escapes. And then she realizes she's pregnant. And I'm just kind of speaking for her. I don't really know this, but I know that or I think that if she had gone to her order and said, um, I'm pregnant, and they'd say, okay, have the baby, but you're out. We can't have a nun with a baby, you know? I mean, I don't know if that happened, but that's what I was thinking. So she decided to get an abortion, which was uh, not something that nuns don't get pregnant, nuns don't have abortions. So she was put through uh, torture, rape, abortion, rejection by so many people. And um, I finally watched her on YouTube. I finally uh, got the courage to absolute, to watch her on YouTube. And um, I could I could tell, I knew people who had met her and they said, uh, don't look her in the eyes. You know, she's she's very fragile, but watching her talk to this other woman on YouTube um, was really powerful for me to finally get to hear her voice. So the reason I wanted to do her icon, I have, of course, her dipped, I mean, the background is blood, you know? and she's wearing purple and um, she's at the bottom of the, the blood, you know, she's going down into it. And then the halo is carrying her up, uh, lighting her head and lifting her up out. And she's wearing that little cross she wore in real life. But I, you know, as a priest, I'm constantly running into people saying, I'm not worthy to go to church or church doesn't like me or they don't accept me. I'm a woman or I'm gay or I'm whatever they are. And I say, you know, you need to meet Diana. You need to read her book and see what she had to go through and, and remain a part of the church. And so she pulls in people to pulls in people to Christianity that I don't think, who else could do that? Who else has actually been through? So <clears throat> I have a friend who's dying and um, going through hospice. And I I brought him, not this this picture, but I brought him her actual photograph and I put it, because he goes through a lot and uh, He's not Catholic, he's Buddhist, but he goes goes through a lot of fear about, you know, the afterlife, what's going to happen and all this. And I said, if you just look at her, you know, if you just know what she went through. And I remember reading, she died uh, February 19th, um, 2021. And I remember reading that when she found out she was going to die of cancer, and this is because from 1989 until 2021, she was reminded every day of the possibility of them coming after her again, or that's what they wanted her to think. So they would send her packages with dead animals and just horrible stuff. 
So she was never away from that. She was always living in the middle of fire, always in the middle of fire. I don't think she ever got out of the fire until they told her she had cancer. And her response was, oh, thank God, that's the way I'm going to die. Mm -hmm. You know, so she's she's just, I wish I had gotten to meet her, but um, yeah, I was taken away by by her. Her whole, the way she made it after that, the way she lived her life in spite of all the happened to her and actually helped other people, campaigned for other people who had gone through the same torture and kidnap and stuff. So that's my, that's my uh, view of Diana. Thank you, Bill. So beautiful and moving. Yeah, there there really isn't any story like it. I don't think I haven't come across one, you know. And she's absolutely unique within all the churches, you know. And my friend I told you about Sandy, you know, who's writing that book called I Choose Love. Um during it, she said to me, I'm kind of afraid to say some stuff. And I said, hold on, <laughs> I'm sending you Diana. And I sent her a plaque of that um, of that picture and she still has it with her. <clears throat> so we can go on if you want. If you want to, or if you wanna take a moment of silence um, to just take in that story. And, okay. and in the picture of Diana, and then we can move to the next one. You know, every every time I I think deeply enough about her, it it just literally chokes me up. You know, um, and I'm so glad that she shared her story with us. Thank you, Bill. Dorothy, wow, you know. What a force of nature. <laughs> oh, my God. Um, so, like I said, I entered the Novitiate in 1968, uh, the, the seminary. And um, Dorothy and Merton and the Berrigans and... Um, Angela Davis. I mean, there were so many people. Uh, there was so much going on. So many, so many people uh, standing up and saying things. And um, Kate Millett, um, Jermaine Greer. I remember reading all of them. Um, and Dorothy. Dorothy again. It. I, I spoke, I hope, I didn't really speak about Diana's voice, but I kind of, what happened to me is I ended up being Diana's voice. You know, I got too choked up to even talk about her, almost. But with Dorothy, her voice, her writing voice is as distinct as, as Dan's or Phil's or uh, Diana's. Diana's voice is just literally uh, a flood of, you know, this experience and and then the hope of living through it. And Dorothy, 
Dorothy's voice is uh, a real struggle from the very beginning, really struggling with something. And um, I've read a lot of people, uh, or I've met a lot of people who are really looking for something and they don't know what it is. They have a lot, maybe they have a fine relationship, a nice house, but they're empty in some part of them. And I remember, I think my favorite commentary on the Bible of all time, and that's saying a lot, I guess, <laughs> but my favorite commentary happens to be by a Congregationalist minister, um, George Bradford Caird, and he wrote a commentary on Luke and on Revelation. And I just clung to those two when I was beginning my work with the hospice. And I would read Luke and Revelation on the subway. And he says in his commentary on Luke, he said, there's with Jesus, there's only one requirement we're getting into the kingdom of God. And that is that you have an emptiness that nothing but God can fill. And that just knocked me out. Um, and I said, yes, I meet people all the time with that emptiness. All the time. People come to me and they, they've got kids, they've got everything. And they're saying, you know, I'm, I'm embarrassed to tell you, I just, I have this, this thing, and I remember when I first got to Albuquerque in 1990, there was a show on TV called Northern Exposure. Do you remember that? And I will never forget the show on Thanksgiving, that guy who went on the radio. Do you know what I'm talking about? He was the radio announcer? Yes. In, yeah. On North, yeah, on Northern Exposure. And he goes, well, it's Thanksgiving. And he said, I've got a hole inside of me big enough to throw a cat through. And I just went, whoa, you know, there's that same thing, the hole. And Dorothy's, that part of her was exposed much of her life, I think. She did not try to shut it so that no one would see it. She walked around showing that, showing the way that she felt that you can fill that hole. Um, I remember reading, she'd pray every morning and come out of her prayer room, lit up like 150 watts. By the end of the day, she'd be down to 25, you know? So she'd have to go back, but she knew that, she knew that walk of feeling empty and then feeling filled and then going back to feeling empty. And she modeled that I think for all of us, she modeled it's, it's okay to feel empty. That's normal. And then how do you fill it? You know, so reading her autobiography, um, <clears throat> the, the relationship she had, you know, the friendship she had, and they always call it bohemian, you know, uh, which is so funny. I mean, we don't use that word very often anymore. <laughs> Bohemian is such an old fashioned word, but uh, anybody my age knows exactly what it meant, you know, but um, even there she was looking, she was searching. That wasn't enough for her. And um, something about, I think when I read William Miller's book, that has that beautiful Richard Abdon uh, photograph of her on the cover. That was the first full biography I read of her. And I read it when I got to Brooklyn. And I remember reading that she was, I think she was in Mexico or something in a Catholic church. And she was, it was a feast day of the Blessed Mother. And she looked up and there was this hole in the, you know, in the uh, cupola of the of the or the the top of the church, and they were dropping down rose petals during the mass from that, and that just knocked her out. 
And she said, you know, the poor need beauty too. You know that song, um, hearts starve as well as bodies, give us bread, but give us roses. And I think that was that was a somewhat of a summation of Dorothy. Yeah, we need beauty. We don't just need, you know, the regular things uh, just to, to get along, although that was her thing of, of helping with people with the with just the basics but she was aware of beauty she was aware of um music she loved music she used to listen to music and um i remember the story i think you all do of somebody coming in and giving her a diamond ring and she takes it and hands it to this poor woman and everybody almost passed out because they thought oh my god that could have been you know dinner for all of us for months and she said the poor need beauty too. And um, so she was definitely on her own path uh, always, but always, always open, always discovering. And I, I'm saying she was open because she, I think that experience of having that, that longing for God, that whole never left her. And she was always wanting more of, of that love, of the love of God. And I think when her little pilot light inside of her, when God would touch her and that little pilot light, could um, empower her to help people who literally didn't even have a mind, you know, literally were not uh, capable of uh, conversation. And um, when I got to New York, it was June of 1980 and she was still alive. And um, I was saying masses for the Catholic worker in Brooklyn and Daniel Marshall would have me come over and, um, I said to him, Daniel, I really would like to meet Dorothy, you know, because she died November 29th. And I, like I said, I got there in June and uh, he told me how she was. He said, she's on the top floor and she's very weak and very fragile. And I just thought I would love, you know, I just love to meet her, but I didn't want to go in and gawk at her, you know, and just, and I just felt that that would be an intrusion unless I had some other way, like a friend say, um, this man really wants to meet you and just say hello for a minute and then he'll walk out, you know, but I, I felt she was, I, the, what was being told to me made me think she was in just that liminal space ready to go, you know, ready to launch. And, um, I didn't want to walk into that. So <clears throat> anyway, uh, my teacher, Robert Lentz, did this incredibly beautiful icon of her holding the Catholic worker paper with the braids on her hair, you know, and I chose a younger Dorothy to do because Robert had already, you know, um, I always feel when Robert does somebody, I don't even try, you know, <laughs> like when he did Gandhi, oh my God, it was his Gandhi is so magnificent that I, even if somebody asked me to do it, I'd go, no, just go by Robert, you know? And I almost felt that way with Dorothy. I thought Robert has done such a great job on her, but then I thought, no, I can add something. If I believe I can add something. And having lived in New York for 10 years, I thought I could, you know, and I added living in the snow, experiencing the snow every winter. And I have Manhattan in the background and then Dorothy and um, she's wearing brown and that's kind of my uh, tip or my um, reference to her Franciscan poverty, her sense of, of poverty, uh, not for its own sake, but the sake of uniting to Like 
Well, I, like I said, Francis is tomorrow, and the astounding one. Of, I mean, Francis is really the so wild that um, you know. I mean, he this the stories of of him are so wild. He was such a such a holy fool, such a wild man. But he, if he could find the poverty in you, he could relate to you. No matter how wealthy you were, no matter what, you know, he didn't just view poverty as not having things. So there was this Count Orlando uh, who he went over to dinner. And then the Count, he found out, was severely depressed. And he goes, oh, good, Francis, you know, I found his poverty. He's got all this stuff, this castle, everything. But I just found it so I can relate to him now. And that was his way of relating. And the odd thing about that is the Count goes, you know, Francis, I've got a, a mountain and uh, I'd like to give it to you. <laughs> and Francis, who would never take even a cloak, said, OK, I'll take the mountain. You know, and it happened to me, Mount Laverna, 90 miles north of Assisi. And it it is it's like a mesa. We have a, a Pueblo here called Acoma, and it, it's very similar to uh, Laverna. And anyway, on that Mesa, Laverna is where he received the wounds of Christ, Francis. So there was a purpose in giving him that mountain that he never even knew at the first time. But it's like Dorothy getting that diamond ring and then giving it away. And, you know, these people were uh, very free with things because they weren't, they didn't hate things, but they weren't attached to them either, you know? And there's just a, a very, it's very beautiful to watch Dorothy's uh, balancing act. And her, her uh, flamboyant fallibility. She was not afraid to be fallible. And she wrote those diaries, just like Merton did, telling just about everything, you know. But one of the things I, uh, one of the many things I've gotten from her, and I, I, I want to mention that with Dan too. But the thing I got from Dorothy, which I try to do, is that when she was annoyed with someone, or when she uh, heard gossip or anything like that, she'd take that to confession. So if someone in the house was driving her crazy, and I'm sure they they always were, and she was driving them crazy too, because just living together, you know, she would go to confession and that, that it would go nowhere. And from Dan, I think there's there's a couple things he taught me. Now, I I never tried to be Dan or I never tried to, you know, I just, I wanted to be around him to see how he, got through what he did, you know? And um, I remember when his autobiography to live in peace came out and because he had criticized Israel, the New York times did not like him. So they hired two conservative Catholics to review to dwell in peace. And one review came out on Friday and the other review came out Sunday. <clears throat> And he didn't show up for dinner. And he didn't show up Monday. So Tuesday, I went up, knocked on his door, and I said, Dan, you know, are you okay? And he goes, yeah, come on in. And I said, wow, getting, getting, you know, pummeled on Friday and Sunday. I said, what do you think? That's, it's pretty awful to me. And he says, well, I think I must be doing something right. And that just stuck with me. And then they said, what do you, that uh, some interviewer said, what do you think of your critics? Like, you know, the New York Times criticizing. And he said, I like my critics up close. And they said, what do you mean? And he said, I like to see what they're doing with their lives. And that stuck with me forever too. Don't, you don't have to listen to every criticism. You have to look and see where it's coming from. And I think that's, that's just a very honest 
uh, way to to live, you know, not to let in stuff that uh, just doesn't have to do with you really at all. So, um, and then I think I, I've told you what Phil gave me. Um, I remember when we visited him in jail and he got to come out and sit with us and we were sitting in the room and he called, he called his 11, his uh, years of prison sentence a little inconvenience. That's what he thought prison was. So, you know, again, that the power of um, dismissing what other people would feel was just this horrible thing and um, raising it to this, me in prison here, it, you know, if he was in prison today, he would say, for instance, this is nothing compared to the people in Ukraine. So I don't feel bad at all. I get to eat. I get a place to sleep. You know, that's how he would look at things. So he carried that. And then I, I think I've already told you what I, what Diana gives me is she gives me somebody to give to other people. When a person thinks they're completely um, unacceptable and, and have done things that they, they could never be uh, forgiven or accepted for, I give them Diana, you know. So I think that's enough out of me, as they say. <laughs> so beautiful. Okay, so what I'll do now, uh, after thanking you so much, is to stop the share. Let's see if this works. Okay, yay. We can see each other now. And we do have some time for conversation, um, questions. Um, I can start by saying, uh, okay, I don't wanna do that. I almost ended the meeting for all inadvertently. Um, but to thank you, uh, Bill, for such a rich feast. And um, I could listen to you all night. Uh, I'm deeply appreciative. And- Well, don't ever say that because I'm a night owl. All right. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, never, never tell me that. <laughs> right. Perhaps one thing, I, I was listening to what, uh, well, everything that you said, but uh, with Diana, and mm. you had mentioned, um, you know, I guess folks were telling you, don't look at her in the eyes. She's very fragile. But with your icon, I, I, her eyes were, I couldn't stop looking into her eyes. Yeah. Uh, there was a, there was a clarity. There was an invitation. Um, there was almost a command to not look away. Um, it, it, you, you, you captured yeah. something in her eyes that I literally could not stop looking into her eyes. Yeah. Well, an icon is supposed to be a picture of where they are now, mm -hmm. not on earth. So now she is, she's home, home safe. And yet I wanted, um, if when you look at the cover of her book, you know, that Orbis book, that's all, her, her eyes just, they're just, you uh, more powerful than I think I've seen in hardly in almost any picture of a person who's been through something like that. Um, yeah, so. Great. Okay, and do we have, uh, thank you, Bill. Do we have others who would like to join in the conversation? Uh, if so, you would have to unmute yourself. Uh, Bill Wiley Kellerman. Yep. Thanks, Bill. It was everything we were hoping for and, and more. Uh, when we originally talked about uh, doing this, we, we were also thinking of including, and it would have been too much, I think, uh, but to include uh, folks that uh, Dan and Liz McAllister as well commissioned you to do uh, icons right. of, um, yeah. And I, it, as I as I say, I think the decision to narrow it was good. But I wonder if you'd comment on those. One of one of those is uh, William Stringfellow, 
Uh, yeah. It's a, I remember when Dan commissioned it and you brought it to, to Block Island to, to uh, yeah. unveil. <laughs> and uh, it's, uh, he's holding the Bible. It says, um, the word is in your mouth and in your heart so that you can do it. But anyway, I wondered if you'd at least mention uh, the folks that uh, Dan and and Liz McAllister had commissioned you to to do icons of. Well, Dan commissioned um, William Stringfellow because he was a very close friend of his, and um, as you as you know, you're the Bill, you're the expert on, on Stringfellow, <laughs> so I, I can't. It's funny to even say anything in front of you, but. Um, and I I used your books, you know, when I was when I was doing that that icon of him. Um, and I I'll just say the other names because if I go into Stringfellow, it's going to be like going into Diana. You know, I'm going to go all the way, and I might not come back. So, ah, because there's a lot there, too. Um, <clears throat> Franz Jaeger's daughter, and then Ben Salmon. Well. I was doing Ben Salmon myself because I read in Robert Ellsberg's book of All Saints. On February 15th, he had the life of Ben Salmon. And when I read that he was from Denver, where I'm from, you know, it's like, can anything good come from Denver? You know, and actually Ben Salmon. So I started to do his icon and Dan came down to my room and he goes, what are you doing? And I said, Ben Salmon. He goes, I want to buy that for Phil. And I said, okay. And then Liz was after me for years to do Rachel Carson. Liz said, I've, I've pleased to Rachel Carson. And finally, finally I did it for her. So um, yeah, if if you want me to talk about Stringfellow, I might not come back, you know, but I, I'll try. I can, I can try if you want me to. But um, yeah. I, 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 just, I just wanted to, uh... They sort right. of get them on the table. If other people have questions, I don't want that to be preemptive. Right. Uh, we, yeah, but if, go, if there aren't on. questions, you can come back. Come back. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. I, I did see one question in the chat uh, asking about uh, the chains on Phil's wrist in that icon. Oh, yeah. The, um, that was a sign that he was a prisoner, you know, and arrested. And... Um, they're not, they're not the, uh, you know, the plastic ties they use today, those horrible plastic. But I, I wanted to make them uh, visible chains, you know. So I actually looked up pictures of Joan of Arc and people like that that were chained with those large cuffs and then, the, you know, the, the chain. I wanted, I didn't want the chain not to be seen because in that way he was chained but he really wasn't but he was you know they chained him up they put him in prison but that still didn't stop him mm -hmm. and then another question bill well i'll answer one of them um diana's last name is ortiz yeah. but another question is why isn't Diana's name on the icon? I don't know. You know, I, um, well, I live in the Hispanic culture, you know, and, and uh, Diana spent some time, I think, some time, I think, in living in Southern New Mexico. So I think she was here for a while. Um, sometimes, like I just, the person I just finished was Alana Chen. And I know you, a lot of you don't know who that is, but it's a 24 year old girl who died a few years ago by suicide. And um, because uh, she was counseled that it was wrong for her to be attracted to other women. And there's a podcast out now about her apparently and um it's the number one podcast in the nation it's called dear alana so i just finished her but um with 
I could have put, you know, Holy Diana Ortiz or Holy Living Martyrs, the title of the piece. But I didn't want to interrupt that blood in the background. You know, I didn't want to make it a background by putting letters on top of it. I think that was my artistic thinking. I always, I always, I have intuitions or I, sometimes I call them instructions that I get, you know. Um, and I just felt no letters on this one. It's, I'm sorry, it's just, that's about all I can tell you, you know. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Bill. I think Jim Reale would like to ask you a question about Dan and then Bill Hartman would like to, to share a Dan connected story. So Jim. Thank you. Uh, Bill, I'm sure you don't know this, but I just want to say uh, how much of a gift you are to all of us. Uh, your deep, deep insights, your your icons, your counseling, uh, and just who you are in the world. So I just want to, I think the majority of us, if not all of us, know that, but I just want to acknowledge that publicly. So there's that. And then I just want to say that I think our dear brother, Dan Berrigan, also felt the same way. So, Bill, I'm going to ask you without trying not to embarrass you, but trying to pose a question that you don't have to answer if you don't want to. You shared something with me that I put uh, in the introduction to the book of Dan Berrigan's poetry, and I wondered if you would share that with the group. Um, I didn't know it. What was it? Uh, was it about confession? Uh, Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah, I don't. It's um. Well, I was I was his confessor, you know, Dan. Um, so it's that's <laughs> as a confessor, that's about all you can say, you know. Is uh, but he, we were that close where he felt that um, he, Dan. I mean, my experience of him uh, was that he was betrayed by a lot of people that he he loved and was close to, and that it left him with PTSD about getting close to anybody. And uh, as we've talked about this before, the closest person to him, I believe, was Bobcat, the mm -hmm. person that was really closer than any of us or uh and was kind of his own personal assistant in a way you know so you call dan wouldn't answer the phone half the time so you'd call up bob and say how is dan and bob was incredibly kind to everybody oh bill hi you know how he was jim how are you you know well dan is just <laughs> dan is just being dan he's not answering the phone this week <laughs> you know that kind of thing but um, yeah, I think the the point, uh, the, I, I guess the point I made and the point I, uh, I made when I did Merton's icon or the second icon of him as a priest was that Dan actually believed in confession and he actually believed in in the spirituality of Ignatius. He would say things sometimes that were just little things from Jesuit spirituality, just right off the top of his head, that you knew he knew everything. And his the you know, his retention of knowledge was phenomenal. And so uh yeah, I think that's did do you, you have something else? That that was helpful, Bill. I was glad that you wanted to share that with others because I've never I never knew who Dan's confessor was or if he had a confessor, uh, but just the the depth uh, and trust that he had in you uh, as a as as a friend, uh, as a priest, as someone who you could confide in. I just wanted others to know that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I was a lot younger and, you know, so I was like just humbled, you know, that he would even ask me. But um, thanks, Jim. Great. Thank you, Jim. Bill Hartman? Yep. Yes. Um, well, Bill, uh, uh, just I haven't talked to, to you for a while, but we recently, I guess, exchanged some information regarding an old friend of yours, um, 
Pat O'Brien, who was the Irish priest that was a friend yeah. as well as Dan's. Oh, uh, passed yeah. Passed away a year ago. Um, but my my point to to share with folk tonight is, and Anna, you would, might remember this. I think I met you first at the probably at the Church of Saint Francis Xavier. It was a program on mysticism back around 1997 that happened in New York City, and the Jesuit priest. Father William Johnston was speaking about mysticism mm -hmm. and yeah. um, lo a lovely evening with him and he, such a great soul he was. Um, afterwards, the folks who ran that program that night, there were probably 500 of us in the church, said anyone that would like to come up and see Father or get an autograph on a book that he brought over from Ireland that he had just written. So I went up and I got to sit on the floor next to him. He was in a Lovely. He was put in a rocking chair with a shawl over his shoulders, a cup of tea by his side. Might have been doctored up a little bit. I'm not sure. And I got to sit there and talk with him. And he signed the book or two that I had to share uh, back at home with John McNamee and a few other. But uh, I said to him that Father Dan Berrigan was a friend um, and that I'd been with him on various occasions and we were plowshare people and all. And he said to me, you know, I have to tell you that Daniel Berrigan is not necessarily beloved by a lot of the Jesuits because he's such a, an outsider in a way. He's, he's beyond the norm, the, the pale. But I have to say to you that I believe when the days are done, he will be thought of as a prophet in our order. He is that prophet to, to those of us who can see. And uh, we, we're a we are grateful to have him as somebody who has a recognition of his life. So I just say that about Johnson's opinion of Daniel and seeing the the gift that he was for all of us in so many respects, deep, deep, deep gift. So thanks for letting me share that. Thank you, Bill. Boy, that is so true. I mean, oh my gosh, we would, he didn't like to go into other Jesuit houses you know, like Fordham or other places, other, uh, and we, I remember we'd be in the elevator and he would have this look of terror in his eyes. And I said, Dan, are you terrified? And he goes, why do you always know what I'm thinking? And I said, I, I can see it. I said, uh, and, you know, we'd, we'd go to lunch and somebody would take a shot at him. Hmm. Somebody, somebody say something really mean to him. Oh, there's that traitor or there's that, you know. And he was right. They didn't like him. A lot of them didn't like him. And um, because the younger Jesuits were treating him like, you know, everybody, he influenced so many younger people. And we <laughs> loved him. But he was, when I lived in, at Manhasset at St. Ignatius Retreat House on Long Island, um, there were guys there that would, you know, they knew that I was friends with him and they'd say, They'd pull me over, over a drink at night, and they they just tell me things about him that they didn't like. Mm. And same when I lived at America House, you know, they would say, you know, I don't like that he did this. I don't like that he did that. And you know, I I was young, so I was much more patient, you know, and I would actually listen. And um, I'd say, I know, I I do know, but. Um, it was, he, they felt in some ways he'd burned the house down, you know what I mean? And um, they wanted that house back yeah. and they didn't want him living in their house because they want their house burned out. So he formed his own community, really. Yeah. Wow. Thank you, Bill. Uh, Jim Robinson has a question and then Bill Wiley Kellerman. So uh, Jim. Hi, thank you. Uh, Father Bill, I wonder if you can talk about your book with Chris and maybe if Chris, I think he's here on this Zoom, if he could say something about the book as well. That'd be great. Hey, it's so good to see you. I haven't seen you in the, since the Merton conference. I can't believe I'm actually looking at you. <laughs> um, yeah, Chris, well, um, We've been working on it for a year and a half. 
uh, and it's been phone conversations. Um, it's a book about my art from age five until 75, which I'll be in July, 75. So five to 75. But um, I think when, when we started, it was just gonna be like me talking about it or saying this picture is this, that picture is that. And then I read this book, uh, Conversations with Andrew Wyeth. And there was a real dialogue going back and forth. And it was such a, a great book. And I sent it to Chris and I said, do you think we could do something like this? I'd like another voice here, you know? And so we, we worked around that book, that Andrew Wyeth book. And that was a, my inspiration for doing the book that way. And um, it contains before, you know, I was a children's illustrator uh, from about 1981, I think was my first book that I got with Paulus Press. All, all the way up until 90, I never even dreamed of being an iconographer at all. And I love doing children's books and uh, other books too, other books for uh, older people. So I wanted to show some of those drawings that I thought were really um, unusual and as powerful as the icon. So, and as you know, Chris is Chris wrote that brilliant book about the hidden Christ of uh, Thomas Merton, Sophia, and that's how I met him when I read that book. So I don't know, is he there? I, I think hey. Chris is on the call. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, folks. Uh, hey, Bill. Hey, hey Jim. Surprise. I'll, I'll, <laughs> just, I'll just say very, very briefly, as Bill said, it's been about a year and a half of um, our our friendship goes back uh, to about 2009. So now close to 15 years. But the last year and a half, uh, kind of being more intentional about our conversations around Bill's art and his life story, his vocation as an artist from age five to the present. Um, as you guys have experienced tonight, you know, it's just such a great, uh, it's been a great blessing and gift to be in conversation with him. And, you know, a lot of the images that haven't been published or really seen widely, uh, you know, Bill is known as an iconographer, but there's so much more that's there in terms of his career as a, as a painter and illustrator. So, and those images really come alive uh, when you juxtapose them kind of in conversation with his life story. So it's it's been one of the great graces uh, of my recent, you know, years. He's become a part of our family, really. And we hope the book will be out in spring of, of 24, um, 12 chapters of, of conversations covering kind of his life's journey. Uh, along with those images. So we really hope that the images, the art will be foregrounded uh, so that folks can sort of view the, view the images in, in contemplation alongside of uh, Bill's, some of the wisdom and the experience that he's, uh, you know, imbibed and shared with us over these years. So thanks for the question, Jim. And uh, yeah, it's been a great, tonight has been amazing, Bill. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Chris. Mm -hmm. Oh, it um, says, do you have a title for the book? Mm -hmm. Yes, we do. I, and I, I found, um, I was in the Fordham Library in the 1980s when I was living in Manhattan. I was looking in the Fordham Library at the Hopkins books. And they had an exhibit book of Hopkins drawings of nature. And I don't know if anybody knows this, but he was an incredible artist and did beautiful drawings of trees and, and nature. And the title of the book was All My Eyes See, The Visual World of Jared Manley Hopkins. So I never, never forgot that title. And... Um, so that will be the title of our book, All My Eyes See, The Artistic Vocation of Father William Hart McNichols. And um, I fought for that word vocation over 
journey or whatever, you know, because um, it's, it's just been, that's been it since I was five, you know, and uh, I think, I think that's all I want to say about that. Or I, I'm afraid of going into something else, you know, because I, uh, when I hear something in my mind about then I want to go there and start talking about that. And then that's why I said, Anna, you should never tell me that uh, you could listen to me all night. <laughs> because if you called me right now, that's what we do. <laughs> all my friends are stunned at how, how long I can stay on the phone. And and the, the reason is in childhood, uh, I was bullied. And so I didn't want to go outside a lot. So I spent all my time talking to people on the phone like a shut-in, you know. So I got used to that. But anyway, um, is this, are we, is we that a, all? Uh, we have a I, Bill Wiley Kellerman would like to say yeah, something. I, okay. I just want to, uh, it's directly related to the immediate conversation. And that's that uh, next April, uh the Berrigan Collective is co-sponsoring with Kirkridge Retreat Center uh, a weekend retreat with Bill uh, McNichols oh, exactly right. on exactly yeah. on this title. It's yeah. uh, it's the weekend of April twenty sixth, which is uh, also Stringfellow's birthday, and I think we'll get his icon into the mix. Um, and it's very possible that the book will be out and available. It's just that's right about the time that it's that it's coming out um and yeah so be watching for that i don't think kirkridge has yet posted the 2024 schedule but uh uh jim reale is going to be leading chants uh at the beginning of each session and uh i think the kind of conversation that we've had tonight is sort of a a foretaste of what we can do together for a, a weekend. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. And Bill, does everybody know where Kirkridge is that's listening? Yeah, it's at the Delaware Water Gap. It's right in the Poconos where Route okay. 80 goes through uh, uh, and the Delaware Water, Delaware River goes through the, the, the Pocono Mountains. Uh, so about an hour and a half or so from New York City. Okay. Close to Bangor. Uh, right. and, and Bill also has a retreat coming up in November. Uh, did you want to mention that, Bill? Uh, yeah, that would be great. Uh, though the date, uh, it's the second weekend in, in November. Uh, it's the 60th. Is it like 13, 14, 15, Bill? Yeah, I think so. The, it's the 50th anniversary of Dan Berrigan and Thich Nhat Hanh's conversation during Holy Week uh, mm -hmm. in uh, Paris uh, during the war. Uh, and at the end of the, the air war was still on, I guess, at that point. And uh, John Bach had originally written a preface to the transcription of that conversation that became a book called The uh, Raft is Not the Shore. And with a, a young uh, student of Not Hans, um, Joe Riley and I are kind of convening the, the retreat around the book, but it's a, you know, it's a present day conversation moving from, uh, from their conversation and Vodin's art, which uh, uh, complements or fills the book as well so, and mm -hmm. and and the collective is co-sponsoring that one as well mm -hmm. thank you one Bill. of my favorite of all his books i just love that book you know mm -hmm. i see another uh question that i can answer uh in the chat uh, yes the talk has been recorded and will be available on the dan berrigan collective website so if you just go to the search engine and you type in Dan Berrigan Collective, you'll find the site. Uh, there was a question, uh, would it be possible to show the gorgeous photo that's on the cover? I wasn't sure which of Bill's gorgeous photos we were looking 
uh, talking about. Um, hmm. I'm not sure who asked the question either. Um, um, let me think. I could maybe get it on my iPad. Sandy asked the question. Oh, oh Sandy. Sandy, could you oh, okay. tell I us what? I yes, I asked the question. Oh, I've yes, seen please. it, and it's absolutely gorgeous, and I just wanted everybody else to see it. Hi, Sandy. Hi, Bill. <laughs> <laughs> Did you see I mentioned your book? Yes, thank you, Bill. Okay. That was very kind of you. Well, it's powerful. It's beautiful. It's mm -hmm. going to be incredible. And Thank it's you. coming coming out December what, do you know? It's actually, I just found out today, a pre-sale start October 17th, but the actual book is not coming out till now, till January, probably 16th. Say something about it, okay? I don't it's want called... to steal your, I don't want to steal your limelight. No, you, you, no, oh, no, you no. keep talking. No, it's my, the light's gone already. So take over. <laughs> you can be in the, you can be lime if you want. <laughs> the, the green light's on you. Just, just tell people the name of it and where they can get it and stuff. Cause it's so good. Um, and you know, Bill, Bill was talking about that retreat and people are talking about other things. So it's okay. I'm, and I'm looking for the picture while you, while you talk. Okay. Okay. Um, the name of the book is I Chose Love, um, How to Thrive After a Life-Threatening Disease Using Love to Guide You. Because in 1986, I was told by five neurosurgeons I had six months to a year to live, which then I got radiation damage and then breast cancer. And I was told I had to get a mastectomy, but within five months, I was free of it using an alternative. I mean, it's just all about how we just don't have to go to the program. I mean, I, I don't have anything against doctors. I've, I've met some wonderful, wonderful ones, but we do have choices. We do have options. And much, much I did, what I did is just follow my heart, just follow whatever my body told me and let, let that guide me through the whole medical mess. I found it. Okay. Oh, good, good. Perfect timing. Can you see it? Yes. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And, and Bill, explain, or perhaps you don't, about the shower curtain, right? Oh, behind it, yeah. There is, um, well, the original photo, uh, I'll, I'll show you the original photo that it's taken from. Um, this is the original photo. That's actually a photograph. And that was taken at a wedding I did. And... Um, you can, when you go to order my icons, there are several different things you can order, like a t-shirt or, you know, they don't have any coffee mugs yet or anything, but they have t-shirts. They have different things. And one of the things they have are um, house, I, I forget the, the title, it's something like, um, well, they have duvet covers and they have shower curtains and you can put your art because I'm, you know, there are millions of people on this Fine Art America website. So a priest in New York ordered a shower curtain of the risen Christ oh, wow. and decided that he could make it into a banner for his church. And he sent it to me and I said, wow, you know, that it really, it really shocked me. So Margie, my sister, put it on my website and then everybody started ordering these shower curtains for their churches <laughs> <laughs> because they're the, the cloth is so good you know it's not like see-through or anything like that it's really and it doesn't wrinkle there's a whole bunch of stuff about it so all you have to do is take the top and roll it over and then sew it and then you know run a rod through it and hang it up at your church we're going to have one for the uh april 26th event bill i don't know if you know that but Great. Jim is Jim is going to bring the uh, the icon of uh, Holy Silence as uh, the big the huge banner of it. So when we contemplate it, it'll be as big as you know that. Great. Anyway, thanks for mentioning that retreat in April. You know, uh, that would be great if people could come. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, 
Thank you, thank you, thank you for such a rich, a rich feast, and for the grace of your presence and your beauty. Thank you, your insight, Bill. Thank you so, so much. Thank you. I'm thank so you. happy to meet you. You know, I just yes. feel like, yeah, it's wonderful. Thank you. And thank you to the beloved community. And I hope that your evening is a blessed one. And hopefully we'll see you uh, Thursday to celebrate Bill's 100th birthday. So thank you and good night to all. Thank you. Good night. Thank good you. Night. Thank you. Bye. Good night all. Good night.